so much. <laughs> this I'm very honored to be giving this lecture. And I hope you're not expecting words of wisdom because I'm not good at that. But there are many things that I care about in philosophy and in life. And when I look back at, the, at human history from the perspective of the work I've done in philosophy for almost 50 years, I see a pattern that I think explains many of the cultural changes that have occurred over the span of millennia, and I want to talk about that. And I also have noticed that, that the, some common themes in my own work that I hadn't noticed before, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. What I've come to believe is that there have been two great ideas that underlie virtually all of the intellectual discoveries of human civilization. These ideas are so simple that it is easy to overlook their tremendous power, and it is easy to forget <coughs> that we did not always have them. And when I say we, I mean the human race. The first is the idea that the human mind is capable of grasping the universe. And the second is the idea that the human mind is capable of grasping itself. I'm going to tell a story about the origin of these two ideas and how their relationship eventually changed leading to a battle for dominance between them that has not been resolved. Here is my attempt at a graphic design of the two great ideas. I promise this is the last time you'll see this. <laughs> um, if you think of the mind as, uh, you know, like a light, uh, we're grasping and sort of shedding light, you know, so the, the, first, the first graphic illustrates the idea that the human mind can shine its light outward to the universe, and the second graphic illustrates the idea that the human mind can shed its light inward to itself. And I think that the way we think about the relationship between these two ideas affects the way we do philosophy. It affects the way we think of the relationship between science and religion. It affects our understanding of the nature and purpose of political life. It affects the way we create and interpret art and literature. And it affects the way we think of ourselves and how we should think of the ultimate human good. So the relationship between these two ideas is of the highest importance, and I'm going to try to give you a sense of why I think that. The first idea, that the human mind is capable of grasping everything that exists, made possible the birth of the great world religions, the origin of philosophy, the invention of mathematics, and the beginning of science. And I think that the fact that all of these human innovations are connected to the same idea explains the otherwise mysterious fact that they all occurred at approximately the same time, in the first millennium before Christ. The idea might have appeared earlier, but we know that it did not always exist because thousands of years of human progress did not rely on it, as we can see by looking at the history of material culture. Creating metals and fashioning them into tools, developing building techniques and cultivating crops and raising animals, are all activities that do not require the thought that the world has a unified structure governed by simple laws, possibly created by a deity. Much less does it require the thought that the human mind can grasp it. Probably any human invention relies on the belief that there are regularities in nature, but it is not necessary to think that the human mind can grasp the universe in its entirety to invent fire or to make a pot or to plant crops. The same point applies to simple forms of the decorative arts and the ability to tell a story. People could tell stories about the gods without thinking that the human mind can grasp the universe. So the first great idea was not necessary for ancient Greek and Hebrew mythology, and not all religions require the first great idea. But in the most dramatic leap in the history of human thought, Humans got the idea that all of reality is connected in a way that a human mind can grasp. That is, humans got the idea that we can understand the world in its entirety. We can see through the enormous plenitude of human experience of the world to discover the numerical structure of the universe in mathematics, the physical structure of the universe in science, the origin and future of the universe in religion, and possibly our ultimate destiny. In Western history, the pre-Socratic philosophers must have been among the first to get this idea. And I'm sorry to say that for decades, I did not really appreciate the importance of the proposal by Thales in the sixth century BC 
that water is the source of the world. In my experience, students usually find Thales and his successors like Anaximenes silly. But the idea that there is some primary substance out of which the entire physical world is composed was genius of the first order. It was the first example in Western thought of the idea that the entire physical universe is one thing, an idea that has guided human intellectual and material advancement ever since. Even more impressive was Anaximander's proposal that the origin and the principle of all things is the boundless or infinite, an idea he attempted to demonstrate by argument, making him possibly the first metaphysician in the history of the Western world. The Pythagoreans expanded the first great idea in a way that allowed them to <coughs> integrate virtually all areas of human thought to a degree that has never been surpassed. With their idea that the structure of the universe is numerical, they were able to connect physics and metaphysics with mathematics. And since they understood the mathematics of musical harmony, they may have been the first people in history to put aesthetic value into their picture of the universe in its most basic structure an idea that has now been almost completely lost. It might seem accidental that they believed in an afterlife and had a disciplined moral code, but I think that that was a predictable feature of their thought. When the Pythagoreans said that natural laws of harmony apply to the human soul and to the state, they were connecting laws of human conduct with a unitary view on the nature of the entire material and non-material world an accomplishment of which very few of the best minds today can boast. Because of the Pythagoreans, the ancient Greeks created and left to us a legacy so close to universally acknowledged as to be invisible, that the universe in its entirety has a rational structure. We expect all areas of human thought and activity to be connected because we have inherited the idea that the entire universe is comprehensible and that means it must be, in some sense, one thing. We have never given that up. The proof is that we still use the word universe. I want to stress that the first great idea was not just the idea that there is a universe with a rational structure. It was the idea that the human mind is aware that it is grasping the universe. I think that the awareness of being able to grasp the universe as a whole transforms human consciousness. The first great idea was a big idea, so it took a big mind to have it. The awareness of having such a big mind must have given the Pythagoreans a sense of power in the best sense of the word power. It led them to the idea that the soul can rise to union with the divine, an idea that occurs repeatedly in the great religions. We see it in the Hindu Upanishads, in Taoism, in Buddhism, and later in the great metaphysical systems of the West, such as those of Aquinas and later Spinoza. The first great idea gave human beings a sense of harmony with the universe, which was expressed in their understanding of morality as harmony with nature. This led to another way in which the first idea led to morality. Grasping the human place in the universe as a whole leads both to aspirations to an afterlife or union between the individual and the highest power and to a sense of responsibility to God or the highest power. When the members of our species came to regard themselves as important, they realized that their actions are serious. Moral laws are not just rules to get along with a minimum of violence. They are the laws demanded of beings whose grasp of the universe makes them answerable to the universe. Humans are lofty beings, and the recognition of that loftiness raised human consciousness to a level that, as far as we know, has never been reached by any other kind of creature. But there are forms of the first great idea that are not transformative, as we will see. One of the most important ideas in human history is monotheism, which in the Jewish religion raised the first great idea to the level of the personal. It is personal partly because it includes the idea that the whole natural universe comes from a personal being, and it is personal also because it includes the idea that a human person can have a relationship with a personal creator. Even before the Jews were clearly monotheistic, they had a covenant with God who required of them that they obey his moral prescriptions. 
but at some point they began to see some of those prescriptions as universal. There are hints of this as far back as the early 8th century BCE in the book of Amos, where Amos declares that not only the Israelites, but also the inhabitants of neighboring kingdoms would be judged by God for their evil acts. The Israelite neighbors could not justify themselves by claiming their behavior was endorsed by their local gods. I see that as a critical move in the development of the awareness that there are moral laws that cross the boundaries of different societies. An even more interesting extension of the first great idea appears a century later in the prophet Jeremiah, where he gives a God's eye view of human conduct in which God invites people to see their faithlessness from his own perspective. For instance, God says, how can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those who are no gods. When I fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the houses of prostitutes. What I find so amazing about verses like this is not what God tells the Jews, but the fact that they thought they could see into the mind of the supreme being who sees everything. By the 13th century, the incipient idea of a natural law that we see in many ancient peoples, and especially in Stoicism, was developed by Aquinas into the idea that there is a single eternal law of God <coughs> expressed in the creation in both a universal moral law, which laid the groundwork for the modern idea of universal human rights, and a universal physical law, laying the groundwork for modern science. So in Western civilization, we see a connected move from early physics and metaphysics and mathematics to ethics, and then to modern natural science and international law, all of which arose out of the first great idea. But the form that the first great idea took in the West faltered. And when it faltered, the second great idea became dominant. And here my story takes a turn. The second great idea that the human mind is capable of grasping itself probably arose at about the same time as the first. Of course, people were aware of their minds long before that, but I'm referring to the rise of the idea that the human mind is capable of grasping itself. For millennia, the second idea was derivative or secondary to the first. There were practices of prayer and meditation in both East and West that focused on the mind, but the purpose of these practices was usually the desire to grasp something else. God, or the ground of the universe, or the Tao, or the One. The mind was treated as a window to something else. What human beings thought of their own minds was derivative from their idea of the place of the mind in nature. Human minds are a component of the world as a whole. So the first great idea that the human mind can grasp the world included the second idea that the human mind can grasp itself. Human beings thought that they know themselves primarily through knowing the world. Even the important Greek dictum, know thyself, was not an invitation to make inspection of one's own mind the primary mode of awareness. It would never have occurred to Socrates to replace the first great idea with the second. People might have noticed that there is something different about grasping one's own mind and grasping minds in general. But there was little or no attention to the idea that the mind's grasp of itself is different in kind from the mind's grasp of the universe, even that part of the universe that includes minds. The way you and I are grasping our minds right now is completely different from the way you and I grasp a universe in which we can see where the minds fit in it. When you grasp your mind, you grasp something that is uniquely yours, both in content and in the way it is grasped. But for most of human history, the uniqueness of individual consciousness was not treated with any more importance than the uniqueness of the human body. My own view is that love is always directed towards the uniqueness of a person. And so personal uniqueness must have been experienced. But love is not part of human thought. In any case, the idea of the individuality of consciousness did not change anything in the way philosophers thought of the place of human beings in the universe, nor did it change the practice of religion. 
nor did it change the practice of morality. Human personality became more interesting in Christianity's doctrine of the incarnation, which directly connected human persons with the Godhead. And we see the importance of the individual in the gospel passage in which Jesus says that God knows even the number of hairs on your head. But the description of the mind of Jesus in scripture is thin in details and is focused more on what he tells us of universal truths that reveal what we need to learn about ourselves, not the unique personality of the most important person in Christianity. So I think that we can find roots of the idea of subjectivity in early Christianity, but Christianity never attempted to let the second idea dominate the first. It is a common place to observe that the Enlightenment was important, and I dislike making a humdrum observation, but I am convinced that the second most dramatic event in the history of human thought really did happen in the early modern period in Europe. The idea that the human mind can grasp itself took on a degree of importance that separated it from the idea that the human mind can grasp the universe. Starting with Descartes or thereabouts, the second great idea began to supersede the first. There are a couple of things to note about this historic change. First, the second idea would not have risen to such importance if the first idea had not faltered. The unity of the study of nature and human destiny and morality fell apart. Descartes would not have made the second idea the starting point of an entire method of philosophy if he had been satisfied with the first idea. He says that explicitly. The Reformation had put the Christian religion in disarray, and since morality had been connected with religious authority, moral philosophy was in disarray as well. Aristotelian natural science crumbled, and the religious wars and the Black Death led to a collapse of social structures that had embodied a common expression of the first great idea. It is true that disarray in a particular version of the first idea is no reason to give up the idea itself. And the first great idea continued to fare well in Eastern thought. But in the West, the effect of philosophy and historical events on the first idea was devastating. The only part of the first great idea left standing in the minds of many was natural science. The ascendance of the second great idea led to a shift from the view that the human mind grasps itself through grasping the world to the idea that the human mind grasps the world through grasping itself. People began to think that consciousness is the gateway through which all knowledge of the world must pass. I know many philosophers who find this idea so obviously correct as not to require argument, but actually it is not obvious at all. When an idea becomes so widely accepted that it appears trivial, it is easy to forget and to misread the work of millennia of philosophers who did not accept it. When the first great idea dominated, philosophers thought of the mind as an open window to the universe. Theories of perception in this period were generally forms of direct realism. When the second great idea dominated, Philosophers thought that we need to construct our idea of the world out of the contents of our own minds. The mind has a boundary, and its contents have a representational relationship to the world outside. Perceptual theories were either forms of indirect realism or idealism. The mind takes in perceptions from the outside, and then has to figure out what kind of world would produce those perceptions. When the first great idea dominated, semantics was what we now call externalist. The meaning of a word is partly outside the mind. In contrast, when the second great idea dominated, semantics was what we now, now call internalist. A meaning is an item in the head. And that made the issue of how that item in the head hooks onto the outside world critical. It is not surprising that the second great idea leads to far more skepticism about the human ability to figure out the universe than, a, than an approach that makes the first idea dominant. If you have to start with the contents of your own mind and then try to figure out how to put those contents together in a way that tells you what the universe outside your mind is like, you have a job that might be insurmountable at the first step. Even if you can get beyond the skeptical threat, 
you will find it difficult in the extreme to construct a view of the world with anything like the comprehensiveness of the great religions or the great metaphysical systems of the past. So the dominance of the second idea had a deflating effect on metaphysics, theology, and any grand worldview. The second idea did not destroy the first idea in all forms. It led to empiricism, not the kind of empiricism of Aristotle, where you look around you and investigate, but the only kind of empiricism possible when you have to construct all the materials of the world out of your perceptual states. So the dominance of the second idea reduced the first idea to empirical science. But science did not transform human consciousness the way the first idea had done before. And here lies a serious problem. Earlier I suggested that the first idea gave people a sense of power and importance. When it diminished, people stopped believing in something that gave their life meaning. Gone was the Pythagorean idea that the soul can attain union with the divine, an idea that has been an important part of many religions. Empirical scientists are often wisely silent on the historically important expressions of the first great idea other than science, but some science triumphalists like Daniel Dennett embrace the project of disenchantment of the world as a consequence of the dominance of the view that science gives us a theory of everything. According to Dennett, consciousness as experienced by a subject is not part of reality. What science tells us about the brain and the nervous system is all there is to consciousness, which means that what I am calling the second great idea is an illusion. I find it ironic that science reached the pinnacle of prestige because of the ascendance of the second great idea. And now Dennett is telling us that the second great idea is an illusion. The mind cannot grasp itself because there is no mind, at least not in the sense that made the second great idea so important in human history. The dominance of the second idea had many important philosophical and practical effects. Philosophy no longer began with metaphysics. That status went to epistemology. Moral philosophy was no longer grounded in the view that human beings should live in harmony with nature, but in the moral and political ideal of self-governance. In reflection, the human mind is governing itself. And so the second idea made self-governance the primary form of authority over any individual person. The acceptance of self-governance is the greatest block to tyranny human civilization has ever produced. And the focus on the value of the individual as a human being, rather than as a member of a social group, was critical for the recognition of individual human rights, one of the greatest achievements of the modern era. But it led to the collapse of the impetus to civ human civilization that comes from individuals having a sense of connection to the order of the universe and the sense of empowerment that the first great idea had produced. When moral theory was separated from the first great idea, the consequence was widespread skepticism that we will ever again be able to agree on what a flourishing life is like to a degree sufficient to permit us to design communities together that embody a common conception of the good. However, because of the second great idea, we now value the uniqueness of each person's subjectivity. And that has been tremendously important for the way we respect and even value human uh, individual differences. That has affected virtually every aspect of culture and social life. We like people who are unlike other people. We respect diversity. We applaud the differences between individual points of view in an attempt to understand them. We would not have cared about that were it not for the power of the second great idea. There were also dramatic changes in literature and the arts. And some of the changes in the visual arts were among the earliest expressions of the second great idea. Think how the discovery of perspective permitted the artist to consciously choose a particular point of view in a painting. Artworks began to be seen as expressions of individual personalities. And in the Renaissance, it became common for them to be signed, whereas previously, the identity of the painter was considered much less important than the subject matter of the painting. And with the rise of portrait painting, we see interest in the individuality of a person, when previously generic representations were the norm. Think also of how literature changed with the ascendance of the second great idea. 
Archetypal stories of the past gave way to narratives consciously refracted through the ego of the narrator. And by the 19th century, the psychological novel had become one of the most important types of literature. In the modern novel, there is a clear separation between author and narrator, where the author may not identify with the narrator and may intentionally take on a voice expressing a different point of view. Disagreements about what it means to convey the truth in literature stem in part from the rise of the idea that each mind is in a sense a world unto itself, a view that not only arises from the second great idea, but is sometimes accompanied by the view that there is no such thing as the world as a whole. But the traditional forms of the first great idea have never gone away, and I think that the lack of clarity about the relationship between the two great ideas has led to a number of confusions. One problem is confusion and ambivalence about the nature of religion and science. I have argued that science got its prestige from the collapse of the first idea in the minds of many modern thinkers, where the scientific view of the universe was the only aspect of the first great idea left standing. As a result, religion has had to battle science for a view of everything. Although it is fashionable to emphasize the lack of conflict between religion and scientific theories about human evolution or the origin of the universe, there is a deep conflict between science and religion for authority in expressing the first great idea. And if science is interpreted as the authoritative expression of the first great idea, then there is also a conflict between science and traditional metaphysics and between science and moral philosophy. The lack of a way to combine the two great ideas has also led to incoherence about the value of human persons, the value usually called dignity. On the one hand, we think of persons as having supreme value, either rooted in our rational nature or rooted in the covenant with God. And that stream of thought arises from the idea of the human place in the universe as a whole. The Pythagoreans, the Hebrews, the medieval Christian theologians, the Hindus, the Buddhists all had a sense of the importance of human beings in the universe because we are the beings who can grasp the entire universe. We have supreme or at least superior value and that value in Western history eventually came to be called dignity. On the other hand, the rise of the second great idea led to a focus on the uniqueness of each individual human being's subjective states. And that led to the idea of human persons as having the value of irreplaceability. A person cannot be traded off for anything else, not even for the sake of another person. That value also came to be called dignity. But superior value and the value of uniqueness are two very different kinds of value. It is possible for something to have superior value but be replaceable. Perhaps any rational being is superior to any being that lacks rationality, but that does not entail that each rational being is irreplaceable. Maybe one rational being could be replaced by another without any loss of value to the world. It is even clearer that something can have irreplaceable value without having superior value. Many irreplaceable things are actually not very valuable. Original works, works of art may be irreplaceable, but not all are very valuable. And the same thing can be said for most artifacts. But the value we call human dignity combines superior value and irreplaceable value. I have argued in other places that Immanuel Kant explicitly mentions both aspects of dignity, and he does not seem to notice their difference and the difficulty in coherently putting them together. I think it is essential that we find a way to do that, but we cannot do that until we have found a way to put together the two great ideas. The two great ideas also have important consequences for semantics and philosophy of mind, and that difference ramifies into many areas of philosophy. As I have suggested, before the modern era, when the first great idea dominated, forms of direct realism predominated in theories of perception. In contrast, the ascendance of the second idea led to the view that the human mind has a representational relationship to the world around us. 
In semantics, this view led to the idea that the meaning of a term is a description in the head. We carry around with us little dictionaries in our minds. When we use a term in thought or in speech, we refer to whatever fits the description in the world. If nothing fits the description, we're not talking about or thinking about anything. There are many problems with this theory of meaning, and I will not rehearse them. But I think that the turn to externalism in its semantics and philosophy of mind, largely stemming from the work on direct reference by Hilary Putnam and Saul Kripke, is an important movement in bringing back the first great idea in semantics. What is important for my point here is that externalist semantics blurs the border of the mind and the world. And I think that is one of its advantages. What we mean when we think is determined in part outside the mind. The contents of our thoughts are not within the borders of our individual consciousness. The moral theory of exemplarism that I proposed in my most recent book is externalist about moral terms in the same way. I did not think of the two great ideas at the time I was writing the book, and I was not motivated by the desire to bring back the first great idea, but now I think that it is an advantage of semantic externalism in ethics as well as in other fields that it requires the rejection of the primacy of the second great idea. My conclusion is that we have two important human powers, and neither includes the other. There is nothing mysterious in the mind having more than one power. The problem is that the exercise of each power shows us that something is missing from the other one. When we exercise the second power, we realize that something of the greatest importance is missing from the exercise of the first power, the unique subjective consciousness of an individual mind. Nobody has ever figured out how to put together a comprehensive view of all of reality that includes what it is like for each individual person to have his or her unique form of consciousness. But the exercise of the second power is not sufficient either, because once we exercise the first power, we realize that there's so much of the world we can never reach by reflecting on our own minds. The two powers come together in the same human mind, and the exercise of neither power explains that. I believe that the two great ideas are in fact the two greatest ideas. If you ask me which of the two is the greatest, I would say without hesitation that it is the first idea. The first idea cannot be reduced to the second, but neither can the second idea be reduced to the first. We need a view of the world as a whole in which subjectivity exists most deeply in the universe. I think, in fact, that we cannot hope to understand God without understanding the place of subjectivity in the divine mind. I have argued in other places that God must have the attribute I call omnisubjectivity, the property of having a complete and perfect grasp of the subjective states of every conscious being from the first person perspective of that being. I think now that the importance of the second great idea gives us a reason to include omnisubjectivity among the divine attributes. And it also shows us the importance of theoretical work on the subjectivity of God. I think that this work can show us not only something about God, but more importantly, it reveals how far we are from having a complete grasp of everything that exists. The individual human mind has infinite powers of inclusion. That is the genius of the first great idea but it also is excluded from everything else. We get that from the second idea. The individual mind has a boundary and yet no boundary. Individual consciousness has a uniqueness that resists incorporation into any full description of the universe anyone has ever offered. Until we can figure out how to get that to make sense, we will not have a comprehensive view of reality. We will not even have a comprehensive understanding of the powers of our own mind. Thank you. With the second great idea comes the sense 
of the importance of each unique perspective. So a story is not just a story that could be told by anybody. The perspective of the person telling the story is, is, is part of what's important to the audience. And then in addition to that, I was suggesting that the author of a story might take the, the role of a narrator that's actually not the same as the identity of the author. So that simply was meant to indicate that there's a, an awareness of the importance of different perspectives and that an author could actually try on different perspectives by you know, writing in different voices. So that's all that I meant by that. Yeah, I mean, you could have some sense of human freedom with the first great idea, but it certainly isn't going to be the same thing. So, I mean, I did mention quickly the idea that um, uh, when the human mind reflects on itself, that immediately leads to the idea of self-governance. And so self-governance then became, uh, you know, the foundation of moral and political philosophy. Um, at that point, it seemed to be the natural, the natural outcome of the rise of the second great idea. I didn't say anything about freedom, and that's a, that's a, I mean, it's connected with the idea of self-governance, but it's not the same thing. Um, but maybe that's something we should talk about later, because I would like to see how, you know, what, what you think. You want to, you look like you're about to. Yeah, so do you think that metaphysical freedom <coughs> is connected with the idea of the uniqueness of human consciousness or anything like that? Or is it, so it's not self-governance, it's something else, something more metaphysical? Okay, I see. That's good, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, now, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about remorse and regret and feelings of guilt. But I did make a reference to the way that the first great idea led to a sense of responsibility to the universe. I mean, we can grasp the universe, and now we owe something to it. You know, it's a, it's a kind of, um, well. Yeah, and so, but I wasn't thinking about, so much about guilt, although that might be uh, a consequence of the line I started to take. Yeah, but I mean, it's, you couldn't really say that the idea of guilt disappeared with the rise of the second great idea. So it has to be guilt in a different form of some sort. But I mean, it, I, I don't know. You're answerable to somebody, and so if you mess up, you feel guilty, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the idea of guilt is a very subtle and complex emotion, and so I don't know if you could just attach it, you know, to one of the two great ideas well, at the expense of the sin, other, but you know, yeah, proof yeah. I did not mean to suggest that every form of the first great idea is the idea that the human mind can grasp the totality of everything that exists, but that the first great idea is the idea that everything that exists is in a sense one thing. So that, you know, mathematics I think requires the, the comes out of the first great idea. I mean, you have to have the first great idea to invent mathematics. But of course that doesn't mean mathematics explains the totality of what exists. So the idea that, that the enti you know, entire universe has a numerical structure, I thought of that as being an expression of the first great idea, but not an expression of the idea that the mind can grasp the totality of what exists. Same with the physical structure of the universe, same with moral structure and so on. So that's a good, that is um, maybe, um, an ambiguity in what I was saying that, that's, that's helpful with your remark. Thank you.
The second great idea was not, I did not intend that to be the idea, a, po a postmodern idea. I think it's a modern idea, but not, it, it is not the same thing as what I think you're, as you're interpreting it as saying there's no truth and so on. I don't think that at all. Um, I think that the second great idea, the second great idea is just the idea that the human mind can grasp itself. What makes what creates some of the puzzles I was raising was the connection between that idea and the first idea. Like which idea comes first? Which, which idea gets preeminence? And the puzzles that I was raising after the rise of the second great idea were puzzles that come, or, or just some of them aren't puzzles, they're just interesting phenomena, that come from the idea that the human mind first grasps itself and then figures out what the universe is by reflecting on the contents of the mind. And there's nothing in any of that that requires that you deny that there's such a thing as truth. The way I hear your question, let me, let me make sure I've got this right. The experience of awe and reverence is an experience that makes us humble and makes us think that we haven't done a very good job of grasping the entire universe. I mean, in other, is that the idea that we just, we think way, you know, we are way far from figuring it out. Right, so there's something that exists that's beyond human comprehension. I have kind of mixed reactions to this because I think that you need to have the first great idea to invent philosophy and invent mathematics and invent science. But that doesn't mean that the people who did that would not be able to experience awe and would think that they had managed to capture the totality of everything that exists. I think it's really important that in the history of the human race, there are so many human innovations that really require the thought that we have really done a great job in figuring out the structure of something, numerical structure of the entire universe or physical structure or some, you know, we have a nice metaphysical scheme that categorizes everything in existence in nice little, little, little boxes. You know, we love that kind of stuff. But I, 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 I think that what you're saying is a kind of caution that all of the energetic intellects in the history of the world should always have in mind when they're inventing their great metaphysical schemes and so on. Because you're right, this, there, is, there are experiences that tell us that there is much of the universe, or at least something, that we can't comprehend. So I don't know what to say about that, except thank you. We'd have to talk about this more because I don't think that being awareness of, it isn't that Aquinas didn't know that human beings were aware of their minds. That's obvious. It, the, the issue was what exactly was the place of the awareness of individual subjectivity in the, you know, his overall view of the way the world is put together. And it seems to me that in Aquinas, the second great idea actually has a secondary status. The comprehension of the eternal law of God, I mean, that's the scheme, and then our participation in it may be via our agency as conscious beings, but it's not like the, the consciousness of an individual person, the unique consciousness of, of each individual person gets any special attention. The uniqueness of, this, of the consciousness of each person gets enormous attention when the second great idea rises to prominence. So it's not just being conscious, it's being conscious in a way that is special to you, that's unique to you. 
And that idea is just practically impossible to combine with the first great idea in any way that makes sense. I mean, they both make sense individually. It's just when you try to combine them that I know of nobody who's ever put them together in a way that I think is satisfactory. So not even Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> you are just, I'm going to have to do something. <laughs>